Okay, welcome to the final session of the 2022 Student Ethics Symposium. Uh, my name is Nathan Tucker. I'm a research assistant with the Center for the Study of Ethics. We have been uh, thrilled at the different uh, papers that we've presented today on conspiracy thinking and um, its social implications. It's been the work of um, a seminar uh, led by um, Dr. Robert Goldberg, who we've been fortunate to have as a visiting professor this semester. Um, and these last two papers um, are by um, Elise Bennett and um, Amadeus Pendre. And uh, they're great examples of the work that's been being done in that seminar. So um, Elise is uh, presenting um, on the Wuhan lab link uh, theory, which will be interesting. And Amadeus is starting this off. They are presenting on um, Butterfly Gate, how conspiracy theorists um, shut down a butterfly center. Um, so without further ado, um, I'll turn it over to Amadeus. Okay. Um, what to know before starting? Basic context, you've got the Butterfly Center. Um, Right-wing politicians and conspiracy theorists are the three main players in this. Um, what happened, uh, the shutting down of the Butterfly Center um, at the Rio Grande Valley next to the Rio Grande River. Um, and this all started in uh, 2016 when Trump was elected president. Uh, which um, in 2017, once after the inauguration and swearing in, construction um, began almost immediately, um, which uh, wasn't good, seeing as they didn't have permits or, and they didn't have a lot of the um, paperwork they needed to start construction. So they started building on protected lands and private properties as well. Um, which led to a lot of lawsuits, and a huge chunk of the money meant to build the border wall was then used um, to uh, help with lawsuits. Um, one of these places uh, was the Butterfly Center in Texas, where, um, I don't know if you guys know this, but the Mission Texas area is one of the most ecologically diverse places in the entire of North America. Um, it has hundreds of nearly extinct endangered animals and plants and other various species. Um, so by beginning construction um, right through that land uh, was incredibly bad. Let's see. Yeah, over 2,500 scientists signed a report stating how much harm and irreparable damage would be caused to the local ecosystem if construction continued. Uh, obviously, that is never a good sign when over 2,500 scientists from both sides of the border have to come together to say, this is a very bad idea, please stop what you're doing. Um, and, uh, well, suffice it to say, it did not stop the Border Patrol from continuing to build um, the wall. And so the government sued itself. Butterfly Center. Uh, sent in a lawsuit to the government uh, for uh, damaging their property. Well, that government was the same government, our government, that owns the land where the Butterfly Center is built. And that led to a very interesting, um, that led to a very interesting contradiction, again, where you have the government suing itself. Um, so it went to a Texas court. The lawsuit was on the basis that the government is breaking its own environmental protection laws by cutting down trees and clearing the area. Um, it was ruled a non-suit, but that was so that they could send it to a higher court because the um, judge in this Texas court felt that this was a matter that was more federal than state, seeing as it was the government versus the government. Um, so they sent it to a higher court. They also were able to rule it a non-suit on the grounds that um, this ground belonged to the government and the government can do whatever it wants on its own private property. Um, 
And so that's how they were able to get it to be a non-suit. But again, it went to a higher court in 2018. Um, they had to order a halt on construction because during this time, um, scientists and Border Patrol were having face-offs um, almost daily um, at the Butterfly Center. And by face-off, I mean they'd argue and be like, stop building, please. You're like killing off so many species, you know, we'll never be able to see them again. Uh, lots of, um, and by building the wall, of course, you block off um, the passage of animals and migrations, and the monarch butterflies wouldn't be able to get down to um, where they need to go in Mexico when they migrate. So lots of bad things. So the higher court in 2019, so two years after construction began, um, finally ordered a halt on construction uh, while the issue was in the court system or until further notice. Um, but um, they ended up having to file a restraining order against the Border Patrol because, lo and behold, they showed up after they were ordered to stop, and they showed up and kept trying to build the wall. So um, the court had to file a restraining order while they were trying to figure out how, what they were going to do with this. And back in 2017 with the lawsuits, that's actually where the conspiracy developed. You have um, people asking, why didn't they want the border wall? What are they hiding? Like, it, you have to understand the context of the border wall plays in conspiracy thinking. It's kind of, it's a monument to protect families or protect their lands from a group of people they don't really see as human or people. Um, or they see them as all rushing in to steal all their stuff and take away their homes and stuff. Of course, um, none of this has any real solid basis in reality. I feel like I have to say that. Um, <laughs> uh, and they also feel like Trump is ordained by God, a lot of the Christian conspiracy theorists. And so by doing that with the border wall, then you have a border wall that's been ordained by God. And through this, um, you have people asking, well, what, what kind of satan satanic shit is going on over here to make them not want the border wall? Well, one guy played into it very heavily. Um, Brian Colfidge, uh, he posted doctored photos of the Butterfly Center sanctuaries. Docs, um, with rafts that he said were being used to traffic children. Um, if, well, and specifically sex trafficking, and that they were keeping some children there and such. Um, these photos were very easily proven to be doctored, but of course that does not matter when you want to believe something a lot. Um, and the Meanwhile, the CBP in 2019 broke the restraining order, which is good and bad. Bad for the uh, ecological systems and environment, of course, and you know you don't love to see the government breaking its own laws. But that led to the Butterfly Center winning the lawsuit. So they were able to hopefully halt construction for the time being. But Bef like on the brink of 2019-2020, the We Build the Wall uh, crowdfunding uh, for the construction of the border wall um, was started. Uh, it was a campaign to help people build the border wall through crowdfunding, of course. Um, but they kept trying to build the wall on grounds near the Butterfly Center um, and were repeatedly had to be shown off the land. And they started um, harassing the employees and um, they started posting signs that look very realistic like that say they're from the CBP to stop people from uh, going to the butterfly sanctuary so they won't earn any money so that they can't continue to protect the land um, at least through that way um, but because of this uh, the Butterfly Center ended up suing that group later on. Um, but in the meantime, they ended up suing the Department of Homeland Security because the damage that was caused was irreparable. Um, 
it's really tragic. A lot of species have been lost, um, less than what would have happened if they had continued. But you still have four years of on and off construction. So that's something to remember. Um, I think that suit is still in, in court. But um, meanwhile, with the conspiracy, you start getting groups that start appearing 2020 to 2022, like the three percenters, which were talked about earlier today, and the Oath Keepers. Um, these are militia groups, and they started making appearances outside the gates um, with their guns and threatening domestic terrorism uh, for the center because they felt like children were being trafficked through there. Let's see. Um, yeah, so they just continued posting that. And then in 2021, the construction was halted altogether um, by executive order because, uh, as some of you might know, um, the current president uh, part of the campaign was to uh, not another foot on the wall. So, of course, he signed an executive order right away to stop the wall. Uh, meanwhile, the Butterfly Center also sued Brian Colfidge and uh, with the We Build the Wall crowdfunding campaign for defamation because they continued to spread rumors about them and misinformation. But uh, with the executive order, it didn't entirely work because the Texas governor, Governor Abbott, um, bought the contracts um, of the people building the wall or who were originally hired, and they bought the building supplies left over and began a construction again in Texas. So construction really didn't actually stop in 2021. Uh, the Butterfly Center started posting pictures on Twitter of um, the current construction continuing and showing uh, how Biden had broken his promise by allowing this to happen. Um, so I think finally he was ordered to stop by court in, uh, sorry, I guess it came with money laundering first, but <laughs> Governor Abbott had to stop um, construction in August of 2021 by order of another court because it ended up being a separate suit, but they luckily overlinked enough that it wasn't another two or three year experience. Um, meanwhile, you have uh, the We Build the Wall people. Uh, they got convicted for money laundering because they took the money and tried to use it for themselves uh, and to fund Trump's new campaign. Um, so there are various things that put, go into play here. Um, it, was, it was all very not legal <laughs> and the courts agreed, so. Um, then uh, against Brian Colfage and others. Um, I was, uh, that was really good. Uh, they were able to get some more money to help rebuild some of the land. But then in January of 2022, the Butterfly Center had to shut down for three days due to threats of harassment from more groups like the Three Percenters Oath Keepers and other conspiracy theorist groups um, who were threatening domestic terrorism um, on the center and threatening to um, hurt um, and assault the people working there. Um, a lot of this is, uh, some of it is archived on like the internet archive for Twitter and stuff. A lot of people were posting that and it was not good. Um, let's see, then the center, after that, like a day after they decide that they're going to close indefinitely because a congressional candidate from Virginia was coming to town. So nearby town, they were, um, she was going to hold a rally. While well, this uh, congressional candidate had been threatening violence against the center and encouraging acts of harassment um, for years. Um, and so with her coming to town, they were in very real threat of getting hurt, the people there, because you're having an angry rally of people shouting about how we need to build the wall anyways, and saying like the Butterfly Center is evil and trafficking children. So. Um, they had to close indefinitely due to that. But during this closure, uh, the Virginian congressional candidate, Kimberly Lowe, um, attacked the director of the Butterfly Center to try and steal her phone. Um, her, she attacked her at the Butterfly Center and 
who else was working there but Kimberly Lowe's son, who tried to close the gate when the, after his mother was attacked and the senator got, or the congressional candidate had gotten back into her car to drive um, away with the stolen phone. But um, uh, the candidate uh, tried to run over her son, and so she thus escaped, but was very recognizable as a congressional candidate, so they were, she was able to be promptly arrested. Um, it got covered up very quickly on Facebook and such. A lot of the comments and um, a lot of her posts were deleted. Of course, you know, nothing ever really goes away on the internet, so we have this paper. Um, <laughs> but she was, um, her, her people tried to cover it up very quickly so she wouldn't get in as much legal trouble for having threatened violence and then acted on it. Um, right now they're saying she harassed her, but it was, um, but the other parties claim that it was um, an attack, like a physical assault, because um, the director was thrown to the ground. Um, so this is still playing out today. We don't know if this congressional candidate will get voted in, but it is said that she is a long shot candidate. So I'll just hope that that won't happen, at least on my part. Uh, um, but um, I think it's interesting because it kind of goes to show how conspiracism or the idea of um, building a belief or a conspiracy about like a world plot or a plot by like the higher organizations to um, take over the world or start a new world order or even just um, traffic children in um, and how that can lead to conspiracy activism with no real proof and I think it's an interesting case and I'm interested to see how it develops further. Thank you. Thank you. What do you? Okay. Great. Yeah, like that. Perfect. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Elise. Nathan already introduced me. Thank you. Um, I will be presenting the Wuhan Virology Lab Leak, um, with also considering a legacy of scientific distrust and the vilification of scientists. So let's start with just a very simple question. Yes or no? Um, are you a scientist? And just to test this, let's take a quiz. I'm not grading it. <laughs> um, I'm going to tell you the answer, but just keep track of it yourself and see what you know. So, <laughs> um, go ahead and read through this. So which of the following are responsible for forming DNA, which is the code for all living organisms? This is the code that dictates how our body um, creates the right hair color, eye color. Um, so that we become ourselves. Everybody has an answer. It's A. It's A, T, and G, and C. Okay, second question. Which, which is this part of the eukaryotic cell? Eukaryotic cells are just the cells that make up our bodies. They're kind of squishy. They make up animal cells as well. Everybody has an answer. It's the mitochondria. They just create energy for our cells so we can keep going. Okay, third question. Which of these are viruses? Kind of tricky. <laughs> if you have an answer, this one is kind of mean. It's actually all of them. The very first one is a type of virus that only infects bacteria. The second one is COVID-19. The third one is Ebola. And then the fourth one is a strain of pneumonia. OK, so what shape does the following protein fold into? Proteins are made by the DNA sequence that we talked about earlier. Does everybody have an answer? Great, because actually nobody knows. <laughs> we don't have an answer for this. Scientists have a pretty good guess on the process of how a protein folds, but we have no clear answer. We're starting to develop AI and other systems to make um, protein folding more available to look at, but we still have a long ways to go. So with that, let's look at the beginnings in patient zero of the COVID-19 pandemic. Let's start in Wuhan. Wuhan is a city of about 11 million people. 
This was at the beginning of January 23rd when the city was on lockdown due to fewer than 100 cases of a pneumonia-like illness. We had no idea what it could do. We did not know the symptoms. Um, the fatality rate was still in question. We don't know how it passes from person to person. In the middle of the city was a wet market called the Huanan Wet Market. This market sold things like fresh fruit, vegetables, um, fish. The most important part was the sale of live animals in this market. Um, but as we can see, it was a bustling market in the middle of the city. This was a few weeks after um, the start of COVID. The market had been completely cleaned and sterilized. Animals stayed removed. Um, but every product, I guess, destroyed. In this right here, um, to the left, is the very first sequence of COVID that we found in this market from samples from the different stalls and, um, I guess, patients who became infected. This was the very first global announcement of COVID that we had. This was on January 5th in 2020. The World Health Organization released a statement about the um, possibility of pneumonia cases in this very specific cluster in Wuhan, China. So as we can see, the wording is kind of vague <laughs> as to what it is. We had no idea what the symptoms were. We knew it caused a fever, um, mucus congestion, and um, had the possibility to hospitalize patients. Which leads us to the next few weeks in the United States. The very first patient entered the US was a uh, traveler who went to China first and then came back and stayed in the Seattle area. He was immediately quarantined, taken to a hospital. Um, you can actually see him in the very bottom corner. Um, placed under critical care in this intensive care unit. We also saw the creation of field hospitals. This was a particular instance from Wisconsin. Um, people started to stock up on groceries. We all remember what happened to toilet paper during that time. <laughs> um, and then school started to become dismissed. But it wasn't until March 13th when President Donald Trump called for a national emergency. This was when the world came to a grinding halt. Um, we didn't see travel for months. Like, we were all in quarantine. <laughs> this era of confusion and panic and chaos led to plenty of time for a conspiracy to fester. This is the very start of the conspiracy that, uh, I guess, COVID-19 leaked from a lab. The origins of the theory are somewhat unknown, but I was able to track it back to four different sources. The very first one was from a Chinese poster on a um, Chinese chat room called Weibo. I believe I'm pronouncing that right. <laughs> right. Um, but this post first insinuated that there was a possibility that because the lab was so close to the Huanan wet market, which had been closed down weeks before, that there could have been a potential spread from the lab or creation of bioweapons. The second article that came out around this time was actually from a Russian news station, which interviewed a scientist with sketchy credentials who believed that China was creating a bioweapon in this Wuhan Virology Institute. The third one is a tweet. Um, this is the very first sighting, I guess, of the conspiracy theory that we've seen in the United States. Um, it accuses China of being an evil regime that is creating a bioweapon, and they reference it as Chinese pneumonia. And then the fourth one, this is the one that started to get politicians to actually listen to the coronavirus lab leak theory, which was a Daily Mail article um, published around January 23rd which claims that experts had warned that a virus was going to escape from this lab at some point. They just believed that now was finally the time. In these articles, they all pointed out that the Huanan wet market was very close to the Wuhan Institute of Virology. There's no measurement on here, but it's about three miles across. Something else to note is that the airport is fairly close to this seafood market as well. So conspiracy theorists believe that people would take the virus from the Wuhan Institute to the market, spread it, and then people would take the planes and infect other countries. 
This is the Wuhan Institute of Virology. It should be important to note as well that this is the only institute in all of China that is cleared to deal with incredibly dangerous viruses such as Ebola and SARS. They have some samples of SARS from the 2003 SARS pandemic. During this time, there are also scientists analyzing the genetic sequence and structure and function of the coronavirus from those very first strains. Something that a few different scientific journals noted was that there was a specific binding protein, which is the protein that sticks to our cells and infects us, was very efficient at um, infecting particularly humans. This started to fuel conspiracy theories that this could not be natural because we've never seen something like this before. This was when politicians also started to um, find the idea very attractive that it could be made in a lab. So as we can see here, we have a senator, a Republican senator from Arkansas named Tom Cotton, who believes that Wuhan has only has China's only biosafety level four super laboratory that wor works with the world's most deadly pathogens to include, yes, coronavirus, to quote. Um, he claimed that this was the first politician or what we consider an expert to believe that coronavirus was created in this like lab that had such tight security and was working with coronaviruses. Throughout the, maze of, the months of March through May, other senators and important people in the government started to take note of this, such as Secretary of State under Trump, Mike Pompeo, believed that there was enormous evidence coronavirus originated in the Wuhan lab. This made it very attractive and I guess spread it throughout the press to the people. In response to this, Scientists started to come together because they were losing those connections with the Wuhan Virology Institute, which had research previously on coronaviruses. So they needed the lab leak theory to settle down before they could get the connections back to the lab. And they believed that too much time was being taken away blaming China for the virus instead of looking at the proper re governmental response to containing it. So um, in this journal, Another statement was published by about 27 scientists, which was to support the scientists in the Wuhan Institute of Virology. Something to note though, which also fueled evidence for the conspiracy theory, was that a, um, this man who is the director of this place called EcoHealth um, also signed this paper. Now EcoHealth was the only organization that was given funding for uh, funding by America to do research in the Wuhan Institute of Virology. So the United States was funding research in the Wuhan Institute of Virology. The type of research was called gain-of-function research. Gain-of-function research sounds really scary. <laughs> it is essentially adding things that make a virus or a pathogen more contagious and more adaptable to humans because then we can better prepare for treatments, vaccines, um, and responses to this virus, if it gets any worse. I promise it's not as bad as it sounds. <laughs> um, but the US was funding a type of this research. A judge ruled that the United States could not fund gain-of-function research. However, there were loopholes in just editing a genomic sequence is not considered gain-of-function research. The scientist in charge of this gain-of-function research was named Shi Zhengli. Now, Shi Zhengli has been doing um, research for about 10 years on coronaviruses in bats. This is her, again, um, from years ago. But she was working in the lab with a team of scientists performing this gain-of-function research, finding out how coronaviruses can become more deadly. It's also important to note that SARS in 2003 was also a coronavirus. These viruses are nothing new but she was the only one in China and essentially the world to be collecting viruses from live bats around the area and performing experiments on them. This was also when another important leader in American politics at the time, Anthony Fauci, the chief medical advisor under Trump, became part of this conspiracy theory. During the, um, I guess, consideration that it could have leaked from a lab, he was found emailing a doctor who believed that um, it was worth looking into. 
However, he believed that there was not enough evidence yet before they could, I guess, pursue another theory. So, um, the, according to um, like an act of freedom, we were able to see the emails that he sent to this doctor where he called it a shiny object. This is an article from Fox News, or I believe the New York Post, where they took um, what he said from the email very selectively and turned it into him completely dismissing the theory. I feel like this kind of put these two on different sides between um, the scientists and the politicians. Politicians wanted an easy answer for the virus, which led to things like this, where in July of 20th, 2020, um, this is a tweet from President Trump at the time, um, where he claimed that the virus was an invisible China virus, which is directly accusing China of it. While he was also trying to, I guess, garner support for wearing masks and making them patriotic. However, his followers also took this and ran with the theory that it came from a lab, which led to things like this, where this was at a Trump rally um, right before the election. People had stuck to it and they believed that China was in fact to blame for creating the coronavirus. And in a time when people panic, we can't blame them for looking for an answer like this. It's very simple and things seem to line up in a way that conspiratorial thinking um, gives optimism and hope for. Because there has to be a purpose for all this chaos. It's also important to note that the conspiracy theory didn't end with the election where President Biden um, came into office. This was where, um, this was only last year, June 6th of 2021, where Trump demanded that China pay $10 trillion for reparations to the US caused by COVID-19. This was fueled by the idea that coronavirus was made in the Wuhan Virology Institute. And it's also important to note that this doesn't just end with Trump. This was a statement from Biden in August 27th um, of 2021, where he started another investigation into the Wuhan Virology Institute to see if it was manufactured. But it's important to note that we didn't just get to this point during the pandemic when everybody had time to start thinking about conspiracy theories. We have a lot of optimism and hope in science. We see things in the media that show only the successes of science. We don't see the amount of times they fail experiments and have to try again, or the things that are ultimately mundane. So we see things like Jurassic Park, where we have gene editing that's way ahead of its time, <laughs> and things that we can only dream of doing to the, I guess, scale that they were able to. Other movies and media also perpetuate these standards where there can be lab leaks and bioweapons made, um, made relatively quickly and that are incredibly infectious. These also perpetuate the stereotype, or not stereotype, but I guess um, popular media that science can be used as a weapon and things like this can happen just in the daily life. I think it's also important to note that for the US, this conspiracy theory also put them in the center stage and made it almost an attack on the civilians themselves. We've now, since this whole conspiracy theory, we've learned so much more. So um, we know that coronaviruses are fairly common. They can cause just a common cold or something like SARS. Um, these type of coronaviruses specifically are called zoonotic viruses. Zoonotic viruses are viruses that jump from animals to people, which makes them incredibly infectious and deadly because they can change their genomic sequence to infect humans and every other animal before them. So, like I said, we've seen this before with other pandemics. For example, H1N1 um, in 2009 jumped from birds to pigs to people. So if it can happen, then it can happen again, which is what science were, scientists were starting to look into. Now they've done more research on collecting the positive test results from the different vendors and stalls around the Wuhan wet, or Huanan wet market. Um, so here we have a distribution of the positive COVID-19 cases in the Huanan wet market. The red is where the highest concentration of cases were, of positive test results were. Um, as you can see, there's still some on the other side. In between, sorry, I should explain too, that there's a road in between the market 
and then one side has live animals and the other one has um, like fruit, vegetables, and fish. Um, the part that's red was actually where the highest concentration of live animals were sold. So here's another um, this image, I guess, that shows you where the positive cases were for humans, the positive cases were found in stalls, and then the ones selling live animals, and the ones selling unknown meat as well, which we have yet to identify. In the end, um, this was a paper published February 26th of 2022, so very recent. Um, this didn't hit the news very big. Um, I could only find a few articles on it. But they were able to trace two lineages of the virus back to bats and then intermediate hosts. They're not entirely sure as to what, but it seems like it could be um, raccoons, dogs, um, even pangolins were in speculation for some time. But these jumped from, from the bats to the intermediate hosts of the middle ones, and then to humans. And then these lineages both mixed to create um, SARS-CoV-2. And yeah, that's what we know so far. <laughs> OK, we're now going to open uh, for questions. Yeah, and like on that too, it was hard to find like a, like you said, like a patient zero for COVID because there were so many. And I think that helped fuel the conspiracy because people wanted the answer and they were like, oh, there's no patient, there's no single patient, which means it could come from anywhere. Um, I also find it interesting too that I found, like you said, a lot of um, bias in the news articles because there is a double standard as the, um, I guess, like where the virus comes from. Is over of like like the suggestion that over the mild cycle? Um, something like that. They just have said that they're holding the children there for transport, and um, it's kind of like the middleman for uh, how children are trafficked into the U.S. from Mexico. Um, but you can go in there for a few dollars a ticket. They have a soft reopening. So you can check it out, too, and see if there's any places where they're hiding children, if that's what you want to do. <laughs> Stories, you know, fighting. Believe them, like 
คนนี้จะดีแล้วอิตส์อะคอนเฟิร์มเมชันอินอะลิสต์ฟอร์ดีพีเพิลอันทักิงบอทอินดิสปาร์ติคิลาร์เอเรียอะคอนสเปอร์ซีทีรีส์อ่าเขาต้องการคำแนะนำว่าประตูประตูไม่เป็นอะไรที่เป็นแรสซิสต์และทำร้ายและอะไรต่างๆเขาต้องการให้เห็นว่าเป็นแบบที่เป็นแบบที่เป็นแบบที่เป็นแบบที่เป็นแบบที่เป็นแบบที่เป็นแบบที่เป็นแบบที่เป็นแบบที่เป็นแบบที่เป็นแบบที่เป็นแบบที่เป็นแบบที่เป็นแบบที่เป็นแบบที่เป็นแบบที่เป็นแบบที่เป็นแบบที่เป็นแบบที่เป็นแบบที่เป็นแบบที่เป็นแบบที่เป็นแบบที่เป็นแบบที่เป็นแบบที่เป็นแบบที่เป็นแบบที่เป็นแบบที่เป็นแบบที่เป็นแบบที่เป็นแบบที่เป็นแบบที่เป็นแบบที่เป็นแบบที่เป็นแบบที่เป็นแบบที่เป็นแบบที่เป็นแบบที่เป็นแบบที่เป็นแบบที่เป็นแบบที่เป็นแบบที่เป็นแบบที่เป็นแบบที่เป็นแบบที่เป็นแบบที่เป็นแบบที่เป็นแบบที่เป็นแบบที่เป็นแบบที่เป็นแบบที่เป็นแบบที่ And I think they know it on a level. Thus, the conspiracy theory to say, "Okay, we are saving children now. We're not just building a border wall. We're finding out these places where they're trafficking children in." Um, so I think it is just confirmation bias. At least you need this to be right, so that you can also have like, so you can have your beliefs reaffirmed by the greater world. And when people continue to say, "Okay, well, that's actually not true either." You have to double down. Um, at least that's what I've seen through my research and my perspective on it. I'm not a psychologist, but yeah. <laughs> um, in my conspiracy too, I found that a lot of people wanted to believe that they were special too. Um, they were very, they were very sure that they were right about something instead of being presented with other information and changing their views. Um, They wanted to believe that they were the ones to figure it out in a very Sherlock Holmes sense, and they're the star of the movie, kind of thing. This is a question. In your research, addressing of uh, like how did the work by public service potential consequences of like how did this affect me towards. Um, at least in how it affects public servants and our trust in those institutions, um, I think it's um, an effect of how we are or what how we don't trust them. I should say, because you get people act, you get people um, seeing things like uh, the government suing itself, like. <laughs> What we just discussed. You have the government that doesn't follow its own laws, um, and then instead of striving to fix it, you have um, a lot of people see the best option as doubling down on their belief that it's already okay and this is good and this is where it's supposed to be. There's just evil in the government stopping it from ever happening. And I tend to think these things are more systematic, at least through a philosophical lens. You get systematic problems that are like. You have the um, Department of Homeland Security that feels it can break laws or cause species to go extinct if it's for the greater good, um, whether that be real or not, and um, as an issue. Um, and then you have people who want to protect the environment. I mean, species and animals, and that all share a home on this earth with us. And it's um, it's interesting to see. These two forces kind of go head to head. Um, they both think they're in the right, and they could, like, they could very well be if there was an actual issue at the border. Um, but that's debatable for another time. Of course, except it's not. I'm um, sorry. <laughs> but yeah. Um, and sorry, just. Um, but anyways. Uh, yeah. Then with um, these non-trust, they just build up on each other. So you continue distrusting the government. Continue distrusting these public institutions, 
Um, but again, that's the, what you based your life and family and your home and your ancestors have built it. So you feel like it has to be right instead of seeing it as it's wrong and trying to fix it. Um, at least that's what I've observed. Um, there's a lot more to play. Um, yeah, like kind of going off that too. Um, I guess in the Lobbyk theory, the conspiracy made it so um, the media portrayed an almost caricature of Xi Zhengli for making um, bat viruses. And she became the ultimate villain compared to everything else. Instead of using her research as a powerful tool for making vaccines and treatments, um, in which over the course of the COVID-19 pandemic, we saw the treatments change multiple times. Um, masks were recommended and then stopped and then recommended again and enforced. Um, we saw medications come and go, but things like the research was halted because of the conspiracy thinking. Um, and I think that just goes to show, I guess, how needed it is to have um, like a very informed opinion about this kind of stuff and actually understand the background of why is she doing the research? Um, why, why sometimes you need to play with fire in science to find an answer for something. In the case of the Butterfly Center, uh, most of the communication was death threats um, from the conspiracists to the people working there. And you see the people working at the Butterfly Center and the National Park Services trying to reach out to the Department of Homeland Security overall, um, but they would not respond to them, at least from what we have so far. They're still in court, so my, more documents might be released later that changes that. But from what I've seen, the Butterfly Center has been very open to communicating, but it's hard to try to communicate when these offices usually communicate in compromises. You can't compromise on this because Compromising either way wouldn't actually be the goal for either. Like, if you compromise on a wall, there's not really a wall there. Um, and if you compromise on the lands, so there's not really the land there. So you have to really stand on one or the other. Um, and so it's actually interesting because in a chance to try to, like, bridge the gap between the scientists, like, oh, 2,500 scientists came together to stop it. So... Um, with that, you have um, the sea, uh, the Border Patrol. Um, they hired a biologist to come through and look at the grounds and examine the ecological structures. Um, they did not listen to that biologist when he said that you really should not build anything here. You are going to cause the deaths and extinctions of uh, hundreds of species. Um, that you can't find anywhere else in the world. Um, so they decided to fire him. Uh, and I think that's about as far as communication went, at least between government agencies there. Um, so for mine, communication was kind of blocked, I guess, um, by all this press coming in. Sometimes people tried to reach out to Xi Zhengli, the head scientist over the um, gain of function research. However, um, she was more closed off to commenting on that because she only wanted to talk to people that understood why she was doing gain-of-function research. Um, she was afraid for her life and for her research because there were so many accusations and so many other lives on the line um, by COVID affecting so many people. Um, but it also made it hard, too, that all of the... I guess scientific sides and the scientific papers that came out about um, like the jump between animals and stuff was 
very hard to read and not very, I guess, report on. It wasn't as flashy to read. Um, and I think that kind of communication just makes it hard to appeal to a large audience and a, a public that does not understand um, or does not have the essential basis for understanding, I guess, the research and I guess, contacting the scientists. So 